Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories have made Sherlock Holmes one of the most recognizable names throughout the world. Holmes is as famous in Tokyo as he is in Timbuktu. But who on earth is he? And why is he so famous? We have interrogated actors who have played major roles in the Sherlock Holmes stories. He's quite extraordinary. He's uh, more intelligent than anyone who's ever lived. We have cross-examined historians, critics and experts who have studied the man. He is what I might like to describe as a thinking superhero. You couldn't have come at a better time! And we have taken evidence from best-selling authors who have tried to emulate Holmes. I wanted to out Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. This is the cartridge case of the bullet which killed Mr. Hilton Cubitt. And what we have uncovered is, we hope, elementary, my dear viewer. I've always loved the Sherlock Holmes stories. I've even acted in a Sherlock Holmes movie, and I've become more and more fascinated by the man behind the myth. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Stapleton. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance at last. You interest me very much. And this is my chance to find out more. Sherlock Holmes is the greatest detective who ever lived. Except, of course, he never lived. This is the house that Sherlock Holmes never lived in. For two reasons. One, because he never lived, of course. And the other, although this is called 221B Baker Street, it is, in fact, 239 Baker Street. Two twenty one B never existed, and where it would have existed if it ever had, there are no houses anymore. But since Sir Arthur Conan Doyle gave his fictional creation an address in Baker Street, and he certainly knew his London, this is probably the kind of house that he had in mind. And the choice of Baker Street was important for establishing the character of his hero. I think it's essential that Sherlock Holmes is in the city, the new London, you know, the new metropolis, the industrial London. Baker Street, well, uh, it's not quite respectable. It, it, it sort of it positions him socially and professionally in roughly the right place, I think. 221B. Hardly an address to inspire confidence. That area around Marylebone wasn't terribly smart in those days. It says something about his, um, his sort of rather unguessable class position. For the last 17 years, this has been the home of the Sherlock Holmes Museum, and it's laid out as best it can be to be a faithful facsimile of that fictional home. So it's from somewhere like this that the legend of Sherlock Holmes emerged and has been entertaining viewers and readers ever since. They're almost the oldest fiction that you can give to a child without having to say, oh, there's some boring bits in there. The first story I read was probably one of the most frightening, and I shouldn't have ever read it, because it gave me nightmares. Believe it or not, I'm getting a chill right now thinking back to when I read that book. He was very good at making the flesh creep um, and producing this um, atmosphere of evil. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The question a good detective should be asking is, where does Sherlock Holmes come from? And why did Arthur Conan Doyle create him? Conan Doyle was born in Edinburgh in 1859 into a distinguished and creative family with literary connections. But it was a family with a problem. His father was a very fine artist, Charles Altamont Doyle, alas, um, suffering increasingly from alcoholism, epilepsy, and ultimately had to be put into, well, an inebriates home from which he broke out, and the police had him certified and put away in the 1880s. The home life of the young Arthur was blighted by his erratic and occasionally violent father. A solution had to be found. Clearly, his childhood must have been fairly lonely. He was sent down to the Jesuits in Stonyhurst, 
at a boarding school and they were uh, agreed to keep him on during Christmas holidays and so on. This is Stonyhurst. It's still a Jesuit boarding school, but the regime here, a hundred years ago, would have been a lot harder than it is today. And it would not have been any easier for the young Arthur Doyle spending Christmas here alone, 200 miles from the mother he loved. A boy who'd almost without mother or father. At Stonyhurst, there are several clues. Doyle's own name carved in a school desk. A boy who was Doyle's contemporary, by the name of Moriarty, and a yew walk, a darkened alleyway between old yew trees that reappears many years later as the location of the first murder in one of the most famous of all the Sherlock stories, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Indeed, there are some who believe that this daunting building is the model for Baskerville Hall. But most of all, this was a place where the young Arthur Doyle could populate his imagination with the characters he needed. When Arthur Conan Doyle was 16 or 17, his own father, Charles Doyle, was overwhelmed by alcoholism. He ended up in a lunatic asylum, and yet Arthur Conan Doyle created this extraordinary character who is the reverse of all that. Charles Doyle was a man totally out of control. Sherlock Holmes is a man completely in control. Coming up, we'll discover that it wasn't until Arthur Conan Doyle left Stonyhurst that he found the real inspiration for his famous creation. It was when Arthur Conan Doyle returned to Edinburgh to study medicine that he first met the two men who had proved to be the real inspiration for the great characters in his stories. And I used, as a student, uh, to have an old professor, his name was Bell, who was extraordinarily quick at deductive work. Well, it's always said that, that Joseph Bell, who was one of Doyle's tutors at university, was, was the principal model for Holmes because he had this sort of forensic deductive process that he would apply to, you know, corpses on the, on the pathology table, to cases. And he would use deduction as a tool of medical diagnosis so that... And he used to practice this on his students. Dr Joseph Bell tested his students by dipping his finger into some poisonous acid and then placing the finger in his mouth and tasting it and apparently suffering no ill effects and inviting the students to do the same and they all did it and felt oh uh, the fact that it was repellent and near poisonous of course what had happened oh, and none of them noticed this but perhaps conan doyle did was that joseph bell had actually dipped one finger into the poisonous substance and sucked a different finger. The Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh now has a major exhibit in their museum dedicated to what they call the real Sherlock Holmes, and it includes a letter written by Conan Doyle in which he writes to his mentor, Joseph Bell, and does credit him with having inspired the character of Holmes. Having got his main character, Conan Doyle then made another really important decision. He created another character. Holmes doesn't work alone. <laughs> he has a companion, Dr. Watson. I'm going out. When will he be back? I've no idea, but I promise I will do nothing serious without my trusted comrade and biographer at my elbow. And it's Dr. Watson who supposedly writes the stories. Doyle based Dr. Watson on another of his teachers in Edinburgh and he didn't even really change his name, or much of his history. Patrick Heron Watson had served as a surgeon in the army in the Far East, just like the Dr. Watson in the Sherlock stories. Dr. Watson, I think, is actually a richer character than Sherlock Holmes. He's certainly a more believable character, in that he's sort of fallible. He's not stupid, as he's often portrayed. You must tell us your matter of great urgency. 
It is obviously not your health. So ardent a bicyclist must be full of energy. Yes, I bicycle a good deal. Slight roughening on the side of the soles caused by the friction of the pedals. Excellent, Watson. The man who has acted Dr. Watson more than anyone else is Edward Hardwick, who played the character in the ITV serialization of the home stories. Mr. Hardwick. So it was a particular privilege to be able to meet the man himself. Oh, please sit down. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming all the way. Oh, this is very comfortable. It's very odd to be an actor interviewing another actor, and you've, you're yes. so iconically linked with this part. Does oh, that dear. does that annoy you in any way? That no, it doesn't. Of course, I mean I'm, he's a great friend. He's become a great friend. Right. Um, but I suppose over 50 years as an actor, it's occupied a relatively small part of my life. And yet, that's the thing that is—is is it yes. the thing that people most? Well, I think television, you, for. I mean, you know, I mean, inevitably it does yeah. that to some extent. I mean, strictly speaking, I was far too old. <laughs> I mean, they're quite young men, actually. I mean, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing to film in a way because Watson is the narrator, so therefore yes. you're seeing everything through his eyes. Mm -hmm. And then when you switch it, become looking at two people, of one of them whom is Watson, it, it becomes a different kind of problem, I think. I retained a keen interest in criminal matters and supplemented my meagre practice by working as a police surgeon. I think Conan Doyle did a wonderful thing when he created Dr. Watson because what he actually gave himself was a way of telling the stories in two levels. We've got Watson's narration, which seems on the face of it to be a perfectly straightforward account of the crimes. It was in the early spring that I was called out early in the morning to an appointment in the West End. Of course, that's filtered through the eyes of Watson himself, and Conan Doyle writes this cleverly enough for us to see things ahead of Watson. There is also the, the, the feeling that sometimes he does the physical work. Watson! Although Holmes is a master of martial arts, it's Dr. Watson who gets to biff people, isn't it? Stop or I'll shoot! And we certainly don't have Watsons nowadays in that sense at all of having some relation or unemployed pal who tags along in order to play the part of we, the rather dumb reader, and ask the questions we feel, yes, I wanted to ask that. Not a sign of a horse anyway. Watson, you have a blazing talent for observing the obvious. The reason the characters still work all these years later, and it is to do with Holmes and Watson, not just Holmes, uh, is that there is a sense of the archetype of the all-powerful, the superheroic character. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, Holmes is actually a superhero in the, in the sort of Batman, Superman sense. He has superpowers. He is beyond ordinary men. But he's teamed with a fallible bloke. The most famous thing about Watson is Sherlock Holmes's line, elementary, my dear Watson. But just because it's famous doesn't mean it's true. The great thing about this film is that nobody in it is going to say elementary, my dear Watson, because in this film we know that Conan Doyle never wrote that line. It's like Mae West not having said, come up and see me sometime, or play it again, Sam. All they say, funny enough, the public sort of invents these lines that weren't actually in the original, but are almost the same. Conan Doyle may have been happy for Dr. Watson to keep the name of the man who inspired him, but as regards his hero, he was not quite so sure. In the very first book, A Study in Scarlet, Holmes is not Sherlock. He is perhaps equally oddly Sheringford. But at some point in the writing, Doyle changed the name. He becomes Sherlock, and Sherlock Holmes has become a brand, a franchise even, recognizable worldwide. So what exactly is this brand? Well, when it comes to a brand, a lot of course depends upon the packaging. Well, the problem, I think, with playing Sherlock Holmes is that you have to look right to start with, according to the descriptions in the, in the books, in the stories. It's a very dinky little tie. We have a few people who still shoot in this type of garment. 
which actually is very practical because this top bit keeps the weather out. Mm -hmm. And then you've got ease of movement of your arms right. there for <laughs> shooting. And the infamous deer stalker. Don't have the nose, and I'm not shaved. <laughs> but there you go, auditioning for Sherlock Holmes. Much of this is not actually in the original books. Doyle does not describe his costume and certainly never mentions the trademark deer stalker. They are the invention of the book's illustrator, Sidney Paget, who based his idea of what Sherlock Holmes looked like upon his own brother, Walter. Sherlock Holmes ends up looking something like this, the epitome of the Victorian gentleman. But behind this conservative facade, Conan Doyle gave his character some very strange qualities and some potentially fatal flaws. To the casual observer, Sherlock Holmes might have seemed like a member of the establishment, but further investigation reveals that he was anything but conventional. What's breaking the tape? And in some ways, anything but heroic. He has weaknesses, he has blind spots. He finds relationships with other people difficult. He finds relationships with other men not always easy. He finds relationships with women almost impossible. Thank you. And he has this weakness, and Conan Doyle would have seen it as a weakness, for cocaine. I can strongly recommend a 7% solution of cocaine. Would you care to try it? Holmes's drug use is an interesting question because at that time, those drugs are rather easy to get hold of. It was possible to buy opium in boots. It wouldn't be like, you know, Juliet Bravo shooting up. I don't think the other superheroes do melancholy. Sherlock Holmes does. He speaks to the dark, melancholy side in us all. But strangely, it is perhaps these very flaws that are one of the most important clues to Sherlock's enduring popularity. If you had a character who was just this superhuman, intuitive machine who always got it right, who never got it wrong, who never doubted himself, who never experienced any, any kind of human vulnerabilities or pain, we'd end up hating them. We don't hate Holmes. We love him. We're even prepared to go along with the stories. And quite frankly, some of them are absurd preposterous, and sometimes not even very good. Arthur Conan Doyle did write an awful lot of Sherlock Holmes adventures. There are four full-length novels and 56 short stories, most of which were serialized in the hugely popular Strand magazine. Doyle was an extraordinarily inventive and imaginative writer. And given the rate at which he had to turn out these stories, it is perhaps not surprising that sometimes he might have gone just a little too far. Their great virtue is you get a story. You get a good, exciting, well-told story. And really, it's only afterwards, I suppose, you consider and say, well, actually, the story is a bit of a nonsense. If you take them as plots, there's probably only about 12 out of the 56 short stories which are good plots. But sometimes, it's the most unlikely stories that we like best. The short stories, I think probably one of my favourites is The Adventure of the Red-Headed League. And the reason I like that is that it's just so balmy. You will, I'm sure, excuse me if I take an obvious precaution. <laughs> the whole premise behind it, the idea that a bank robber would lure somebody away from the scene of his crime by this elaborate scheme of creating a society that's only open to red-headed people. It's just a ludicrous idea. My personal favourite, and it's not because of my age, is The Adventure of the Creeping Man. It's the story of a man about to marry a much younger woman who injects himself with monkey serum to increase his um, <coughs> vitality. It's a sort of Victorian Viagra. But the side effects are less than uplifting he ends up turning himself into a monkey. Up there. Look! 
In fact, of course, Conan Doyle knew that he was verging on the ridiculous. It was a joke he played with. And in some of the Sherlock stories, his narrator, Dr. Watson, mentions other cases, even more absurd, which for reasons of social delicacy or national interest, he was unfortunately unable to tell. Some of those are just wonderful. I mean, Riccoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. And you think, well, that's a wonderful story somewhere. Or there's the story of the politician, the lighthouse and the trained cormorant. <laughs> That is a fantastic story as well. If you could come up with the, the story that went behind the politician, the lighthouse and the train cormorant, you'd have written one of the best Sherlock Holmes stories ever. Coming up, we'll discover just what it was that made our fatally flawed hero and these preposterous stories so extraordinarily popular. How often have I said to you that once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. <laughs> I'm one of many actors who's appeared in a Sherlock Holmes story, but only a handful of actors have played the great man himself. I did come up against Holmes, though, in this, The Hound of the Baskervilles, in which I came to a very sticky end. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. So I'm very curious to know just why Sherlock was so damnably good at detecting. and if I said to you that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. We admire Sherlock Holmes because he is that thing that we all want to be, a superb reasoning and thinking machine. We want to come into a room, glance at someone and say to them, ah. You have come by train, I see, this morning. You know me, then? No, but I observe the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. What I loved about the Sherlock Holmes books was that, yes, he had his Webley pistol, and yes, he knew fisticuffs, but he fought with his mind. I think one of the intriguing things also about Holmes was there a sense in which he was the first forensic detective. He was the first one who, who examined things in a sort of scientific and logical and precise way. Wilson, that vibrations. Holmes is undoubtedly the pioneer of, of forensic science. Carrington obviously read his journals. He knew what the latest thing was, and he, and he made Holmes do it. Holmes is not a man for the big picture. He piles little bits of evidence together. You know, he's the man who wrote the monograph on the, the differentiable types of cigarette ash. So he's, a, you know, he's an observer of small trifles that from which, uh, you know, can be yielded these amazing and dramatic conclusions. I don't think I'd say that Sherlock Holmes necessarily inspired modern forensic science, but I think it is uncanny that the methods he was using in fiction over 100 years ago are very, very similar to the methods that are used on a day-to-day -day basis in modern detective work. This is the city in Islington College in North London, where modern forensic crime scene officers are trained. And here, they are happy to pay homage to Sherlock Holmes. The scene that the training officers are about to process here is inspired by the murder in the very first Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet. OK, uh, briefing details are a police officer has attended at this scene following sounds of disturbance. OK, the house is empty, it's a deserted house. But he's looked through the windows and he's seen a uh, deceased meal on the floor. That's all the information we have so far about that. OK, the paramedics come and declare life extinct. OK, so you don't need to worry about that. OK, so we want you just to go and process the scene as you would. Any questions or if you need any additional equipment, give us a shout. OK, OK. okay. Yeah. I'm going to skid around on this floor. In the 21st century, enormous care is taken not to disturb or contaminate the scene. In the 19th century, Sherlock didn't take quite so many precautions. Uh, what's that you've got? Uh, cigar ash, Mr. Lestrade. Lucy, there's something on the wall here in a blood-like substance. What do you make of that, Mr. Holmes? Written in blood, eh? 
Rach? Yeah, exactly. He was about to write the female name, Rachel. It's not a commonly used word, is it? We don't even know if it is a word. Um, I don't know if it's a name or... And while I remember, there's a, uh, a ring. Yeah, we are. A woman's wedding ring. You see? I was right. There's been a woman here. You'll find her name was Rachel. Sure, she loved them. Whatever the difference in costume, Holmes didn't have a white paper suit in his wardrobe. His obsessional interest in detail is something that is inherited by his modern counterparts, and he was definitely at the cutting edge of the modern forensic science of his day. Next to the body. Fingerprinting is actually quite an old science. It's been about in various forms for quite a long time, but it was round about the time of Sherlock Holmes that it started to sort of develop into a more exact science, really. Yeah. Right. In the original story, the police are confident that the evidence all points one way. You mark my words, Mr. Holmes. When this case is cleared up, you'll find there's a woman named Rachel up to her neck in it somehow. Okay. Having carefully collected all the evidence, what do the modern Sherlock's deduce from this scene? Okay, Karen. So who did it? I think at this stage it's very difficult to say and make those kind of decisions, to be honest, that we oh, need more. That's why you need Sherlock. Yeah, 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 we definitely need Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes would have decided instantly. He wouldn't be faffing around and taking as long as he does have to. <laughs> There has been murder done, and the murderer is a man. He is more than six feet tall. He wore coarse, square-toed boots and smoked a Trichinopoly cigar. His face is florid, and the fingernails of his right hand are remarkably long. He came here with his victim in a two-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on its off falling. These are just a few indications, but they may assist you. Good day, gentlemen. As we're collecting clues in our study of Sherlock Holmes, it's worth remembering here that Holmes is not a policeman. And although Sherlock often works alongside the police, he doesn't have a very high opinion of them. The most famous of the fictional Scotland Yard detectives who consulted Sherlock Holmes was Inspector Lestrade. Listen to this, Holmes. Come instantly, 131 Pitt Street, Kensington, Australia. What's it about? The depiction of the police in the, in the Sherlock Holmes stories, which was very influential. I mean, policemen were idiots in detective fiction for a good 50 years thereafter because of the way Lestrade is presented. So then I would like to keep this photograph found in the dead man's body. Oh, Mr. Holmes, that might be a vital clue. That just it is, otherwise it's of no interest to me. He's not presented as inept. Good luck, Lestrade. In fact, Sherlock Holmes says that he's the best of a bad bunch. What? The, the, the reason they're dismissed is that they don't solve the mystery. In the world of Holmes and Watson, solving mysteries is the important job. And only the inspired outsider, unrestricted by the bureaucracy of the police manual, can really resolve the problems and deliver true justice. What do you want? Justice. I think perhaps with Sherlock Holmes, more than any other character has ever been before or since, there is a theme of good and evil that prevails through, through the books. Holmes dispenses his own form of justice, not always the strict justice of the law, but his, what he sees as being right himself. Justice? For whom? That we are not partisan. Holmes is not the agent of the police. Holmes is not an agent of the state. Um, he makes his own moral judgments. We just want to see justice done, that is all. Sherlock Holmes sometimes takes the law into his own hands. I mean, he lets murderers off occasionally. He can be a person who is above the law, who serves, you know, moral law rather than legal law. It is a great responsibility that I take upon myself. He treats the whole thing as a kind of intellectual game, which he's slightly detached from. And at the end of that intellectual game, he seems to decide he's judge and jury as well at the end of the game. You have heard the evidence. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? No, not guilty. Box popular, box there. You are acquitted, Captain Cox. Holmes is never wrong. He sometimes comes to the wrong conclusions, but he never does the wrong thing. Holmes is certainly very unorthodox, not only in his methods, but also his ends. Um, there are occasions when he allows um, the suspect to get away. Uh, there are times, again, of course, when he's actually uh, killed a suspect himself indirectly. So you, Holmes, were indirectly responsible for his death. I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily on my conscience. Certainly as a police officer, it's not something we encourage. 
He spends all his time, you know, reuniting estranged lovers, enabling honest young men to get on the right track. A happy ending to a brilliant case. I congratulate you, Holmes. There is a great Victorian paternalism to Sherlock Holmes. There is a real sense that, you know, he will make sure that the, that good people have happy outcomes and that bad people are punished. That's what he does. The creation of Sherlock Holmes coincided with the birth of the cinema. And Conan Doyle's simple stories of rewarding the good and punishing the bad made Holmes and Watson perfect candidates for the transfer to the silver screen. Sherlock Holmes started appearing on film in 1900. It was a silent movie that lasted only 45 seconds, so it certainly wasn't a story by Conan Doyle, but it was the start of an astonishing screen career. Already by the time his creator died in 1930, there had been more than 100 Sherlock Holmes films, more stories than Doyle had ever written. Since the beginning of his screen career, the character of Holmes has been played by many different actors. Some have become legendary in the role, and everyone has their favourites. I think Basil Rathbone looked more like Sherlock Holmes than any other actor. The greatest Sherlock Holmes without question, in my view, was Peter Cushing. Most of the Sherlock Holmes films were new stories that bore little or no resemblance to Conan Doyle's originals. The most often filmed genuine Sherlock story is The Hound of the Baskervilles. What was it? What was it? It was not until the 1980s that anyone embarked on the monumental task of televising every single one of Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. The series starred Jeremy Brett as the great detective. The ITV series of Sherlock Holmes was a huge success, and all of the most acclaimed actors of that generation queued up to take part. John Thor, Eric Porter, Cheryl Campbell, Michael Jaston, Peter Vaughan. And there were some actors who started a distinguished career in Sherlock Holmes. Like Jude Law. Robert Hardy secured the plum role of the villain in a feature-length special called The Master Blackmailer. One of the things that I remember latching on to in The Master Blackmailer was that he was, he had sort of ideas above his day. He was a terrible snob, a really odious snob. And um, I think, well, I th did I drop my G's or something like that? And yet here I find you, Mr. Holmes, a man of sense, boggling at terms, when the whole future and honor of your client is at stake. You surprise me, you do, really. The death of the master blackmailer at the end is uh, by the old countess. <laughs> it's a setup which Holmes knows all about. Does he stop her? No. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. He's, he's his own lawyer, his own judge. For a whole generation, Sherlock Holmes simply is Jeremy Brett. I don't know what it was about Jeremy Brett, but I fell in love with him immediately and unconditionally and have never reviewed it. For me, Jeremy Brett was Sherlock Holmes. When I go back and reread a story, I now picture Jeremy Brett. I'm going to agree with everybody else. It has to be Jeremy Brett. What he gets superbly well is, is the sheer weirdness and oddness of, of Holmes, that Holmes in the stories is a person very, very different and eccentric and strange and neurotic, and Brett captures that far better than any other actor that I've ever seen. Now, gentlemen, if you would give me your undivided attention. You know, he almost seems a kind of vampiric figure sometimes. He's so cadaverous, and he's so white, um, and, you know, he has that slick back hair. You're right, old man. 
A witness to Jeremy Brett's extraordinary technique was the man who played Dr. Watson alongside him for so long. I always think Jeremy, for example, brought quite a few things to Sherlock Holmes that maybe Conan Doyle hadn't even thought of. He was able to bring a touch of Edwardian acting yes. onto the small screen, which was right for the character, but mm -hmm. an extraordinary feat to do, because he would do the most extraordinary... You know, the director would give him a note, and he'd do some extraordinary gesture, and you think, can't get away with it, and then it would work. <laughs> I think what made him very particular as Holmes was a quality that he had anyway in himself, which was a very androgynous quality. It was not quite fish or fowl or whatever, but he was also very sexy. Jeremy Brett was so very, very special as Sherlock Holmes, a very special human being, I think. So it was a beautiful marriage between who the man was, his acting skills, and this particular product. I think one of the reasons that Jeremy was so absolutely wonderful as Holmes was because, rather like Holmes's author, he became obsessed with it. Watson, what is the medical term for obsession? I really felt he was Sherlock Holmes. I went to see him after he'd been in his two-man show as Sherlock Holmes in his dressing room, and I think he was opening a champagne bottle with a sword stick. He was still Sherlock Holmes. It was extraordinary. The role of Sherlock Holmes does take people over. I've talked to people who worked at the Midland Hotel, where he lived while he was making the Sherlock Holmes series. And they said, well, they used to kind of dread serving him, really, because they just get stuck with Sherlock Holmes for the evening and not be able to escape. Tragically, Jeremy Brett died before all the stories could be dramatised. He's now part of the Holmesian legend. And the legend lives on, often in strange and unpredictable ways. And that is why, as we'll see in the next part, Sherlock has survived all attempts to destroy him. Most people love Sherlock Holmes because he represents the force of good in a world of evil. But not everyone loves him. Not even the man who created him. In Sherlock Holmes' battle between good and evil, the name most people associate with evil is Professor Moriarty. If Sherlock Holmes is the first superhero, then Professor Moriarty is the first supervillain. But Holmes's arch enemy Moriarty only really appears in one of the original Sherlock Holmes stories. The invention of Moriarty is interesting for lots of reasons. I mean, firstly, to find a villain who's big enough to actually set against Sherlock Holmes. So you have to, you have to have a super villain because you've got a super detective. It's a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown. Moriarty may be described as the Napoleon of crime, but the crime he commits is one that Conan Doyle wants him to commit. Doyle wants Sherlock Holmes dead. You frustrated me in the affair of the French gold. So it was you behind the red-headed Lee. Conan Doyle's whole reputation as a writer does rest undoubtedly on Sherlock Holmes. And yet, of course, in the end, he hated his character. He despised the stories. You stand fast. Absolutely. He really thought that he'd been over-celebrated for the least important part of his um, literary output. It has been an intellectual treat to me to see the way in which you've grappled with this matter. <laughs> you occasionally get popular artists who don't want to be remembered for the thing they're really good at. Conan Doyle was really good at Sherlock Holmes stories. He thought he'd get into the history books for writing long historical novels. And he was wrong. In fact, he said that if he had not devoted so much time to Sherlock Holmes, 
who has tended to obscure, he said, my higher works, uh, my position in English literature would be a more commanding one. Well, one is tempted to say, what higher works? Conan Doyle himself felt that the character, in, in his own mind, was fairly trivial. So, uh, as everybody knows, he killed Holmes off at the Reichenbach Falls in the clinches of Moriarty. <laughs> So it seems Conan Doyle used Professor Moriarty as a hired assassin to kill Sherlock Holmes in 1893. Can this be the end of our investigation? The answer, of course, is no. Such was the public outcry by the readers of uh, Strand magazine. Uh, a few years later, he had to bring him back again. Um, and I, I suggest that uh, he brought him back, not least of all, because of the financial inducements he was made at the time. Sherlock Holmes's death and return is almost exactly like that, that whole, you know, writing off an entire season of Dallas as a dream, you know. Um, the, the kind of squirming you have to do uh, in order to keep your series going and also in order to take back your mistakes. Watson, do you mind if I smoke a cigarette in your consulting room? There's something wonderfully theatrical about this character who has left the stage forever reappearing. A thousand apologies, my dear Watson. I had no idea that you'd be so affected. Oh, does it really? You? There may be many reasons why Doyle agreed to the return of Sherlock Holmes, but really he had no choice. By the turn of the century, Sherlock Holmes was part of the culture, an icon, a brand. And a hundred years later, the influence of Holmes is everywhere. No detective series with two leads can fail to be influenced by um, Holmes and Watson. Any story which has a maverick, independent detective figure who uh, has, to, uh, has a private client and goes off and sorts things out and is always one step ahead of the police basically goes back to Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes was an inspiration for Lincoln Rhyme. The Lincoln Rhyme character is paralyzed. He's a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. In the Sherlock Holmes stories, he had to outthink the villain. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to do with Lincoln Rhyme. I wanted to out Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. People travel from all over the world to see Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street. It is extraordinary to me that he is an icon in many ways. I mean, I wonder how many young people actually read the stories now. So that if you said to a young person, or indeed perhaps anybody, um, who is Sherlock Holmes, they would say he's a great detective and he lived probably in Baker Street. Then you could go on who wrote about him, then I think a decreasing number would be able to tell you it was Conan Doyle. And then if you said, well, give me the plot of one of the stories, his most famous stories, then I think of very, very, very few. That is what is interesting. So he's an icon because he's always there. And some people spend their lives making sure that he's always there. Ah, oh, Watson. Come, Watson, we have work to do, I feel. As a member of the Sherlock Holmes Society in London, Sir Anthony Richards has taken his obsession one step further and now plays Sherlock in special murder mystery evenings. And ask questions about them and make your own deductions. Murder mystery evenings are a very fun way to spend an evening. If you have a group of friends or a party and you just don't want a straightforward uh, meal and conversation, this lets people enter into the spirit of Sherlock Holmes. They can have a murder over the dinner and they can try and be Sherlock Holmes themselves and solve it before the actors playing Holmes and Watson manage to do it. I'm looking into the murder of Dr. Dieter and I believe that you were on the scene of the crime. Could you come this, this way, madam? One of the questions I get asked most is, is, was Holmes a real character or not? And I would say of the audiences that we perform for, at least 20 or 30% of those thinks Holmes is a real character. He is regarded if only subconsciously by a mass of those who read him as, as a, a real person who actually lived and possibly still is alive. 
Holmes is, is now a sort of immovable object in our culture, I think. He'll never go away. We fall in love with Sherlock Holmes because we want to be inside his head looking out. We look into Sherlock Holmes' eyes and we see a reflection of the best part of ourselves. If we ever need him, he's going to be there. It's almost like, you know, the myth of King Arthur. You know, there he is with his knights slumbering in Avalon, and at Britain's greatest hour of need, he'll be back. The great advantage of never having lived is never having to die. I tried to kill him in The Hound of the Baskervilles. Even Conan Doyle tried to kill him. But Sherlock Holmes survived, and he continues to survive in one form or another and he probably always will.